Um, so welcome everybody. I guess we may as well get started. Uh, we have about uh, 29 or 30 people on the line. Uh, welcome to the March 25th midday meeting of the Rotary Club of Rochester. I am uh, Chris Colby, 2021 president of your club. Welcome uh, everyone. Uh, John uh, Woodruff is going to uh, lead us in the four-way test. And John, uh, I guess you want to share screen, so. Well, I, I can't get the PowerPoint to go into the share screen thing. I don't know how to do it, I guess. Okay. So we're just going to go with a, I made a nice one up, but. Yeah, well, the. the, the we'll go with the old fashioned standard one. The old fashioned way. John will say each line of the four-way test and then with everyone repeat after him. So have a have at it, John. Uh, I, I guess uh, John, would you like me to uh, share the screen with what you sent me? I think I got that. Well no, I I think basically we'll, Okay. Uh, I mean I could, well basically I, I just wanted to say that uh, once when I looked up the four way task it was uh, initiated by a Herbert J. Taylor who did it for his own, uh, he's a prosperous businessman, he did it for his own company that had a troubled business. And uh, the four-way test is a non-partisan, not secretary ethical guide for Rotarians used for their personal and professional relationship. The test has been translated into more than 100 languages and the Rotarians recite it at club meetings. Okay, so we can start of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? First, is it the truth? Yes, Second, is it fair to all concerned? Second, is it Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Third, and fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you. The, uh, the, the four-way test has a has a long, long. We hope we put that into a play uh, with a, a a program of some time uh, to uh, educate people on uh, the history of it. But uh, so, in any case, uh, moving on, uh, the uh, Audrey is going to do the inspiration. If I can find Audrey, I don't see her. Yep. On. I'm here. Okay, Audrey Betcher, President-elect, is going to uh, lead us in the... Audrey, go ahead. So I have got a quote from Dr. Stacy Maxwell Krakenberger. Leadership is when you have the integrity coming from the mindset to be of service and to add value to other people's lives through personal development, empowering them to the highest levels of who they are by implementing their own innate, unique gifts and talents and making them a part of something much bigger than themselves and guiding them into becoming the fullest expression of who they were created to be. This is when you achieve true success. Very good, thank you. Might, uh, please uh, please uh, put yourself on mute if you're not a uh, speaker so we don't get all the inter interaction here. Thank you. Um, do we have any uh, speaking of uh, going, uh, going uh, on mute? Uh, can you? Uh, uh, we had any uh, visitors that uh, 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 are uh, on the line here. I only have I have one screen and the second screen, and I don't see any visitors other than the ones which we'll introduce from that to have uh, a couple of couple of things to say from a program standpoint. So uh, with that. Um, I want to remind everyone that uh, our Rotary online Zoom meetings will continue in the foreseeable future. I'm thinking that uh, the foreseeable future might be coming along fairly uh, soon here, at least uh, in some fashion where we may be able to do uh, do some hybrid uh, meetings. And uh, we'll, we're starting to talk about that. I know Audrey is uh, pushing uh, for the idea that we'll try to put that in operation. Uh, Chris, can I jump in for one second? Certainly can. So if there's anybody who would like to help with the technology piece, uh, please reach out to me because we're going to put a little committee together to make sure we have it figured out so we can stay hybrid um, for 
Um, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of people who find this option um, nice when you can't get away from work for very long. So um, if you are interested in participating on that, please reach out to me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh, is definitely coming down the line. And, uh, and a recollection that, uh, you know, when we did the hybrid meetings at the, at the country club, uh, we had some technical uh, limitations there, but uh, 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 we'll have to make sure that everybody kind of bears with us as we uh, try to get back into that because it's a, it's a fairly complicated technology thing when we have speakers who have programs and PowerPoints to, uh, to uh, show. So, um, so just uh, so that you're aware, then our, our uh, meetings then are on our uh, second, fourth, third meeting. And uh, the first, first meeting of the month is a after hours rotary uh, get together, which has been uh, fairly limited in, uh, in attendance. So if you're interested, uh, uh, let's plug in, plug into that uh, a theme of whatever it might be would be, uh, would be listed in the, uh, in the moccasin flower uh, as it comes out on uh, Tuesday evening or Wednesday morning. Uh, also a reminder that the third Thursday is the small group meetings you know, will continue to be held in whatever format and schedule your uh, group and your convener have uh, identified and they will, uh, the convener will send out the email invites to uh, each of you. So uh, hopefully uh, that, that seems to be going well and we're getting some traction with uh, the different groups. So I think we're all seeing the, some opportunities there that are working out very well. Um, I guess uh, another item here, referring, uh, refer all of you to the moccasin flower that because of uh, our inability to meet, uh, that's become a real important uh, connection for everybody to uh, uh, watch for the announcements of uh, opportunities, both community service and volunteer type of activities that might be available. Uh, we have a couple of them uh, coming up as announcements here uh, later in the meeting and uh, signups will be available on the, on the, uh, uh, through the Moxon Flower and on the website, assuming Lori can get it figured out on how to get all that done, which I'm sure she can, she's the best. So uh, keep in mind that uh, that's a place to, uh, to uh, follow those, uh, those events. Um, Judy Wilson from the Greater Rochester Rotary Club uh, uh, is, uh, as an announcement regarding their upcoming tool, April tool, uh, that uh, she, I believe she has a, a short uh, uh, video with that. Uh, Colin, you want to uh, kind of set that up? And Judy, uh, you want to unmute yourself and uh, go ahead? That would be great. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Paul. For allowing me some time in your meeting. Uh, I have um, an opportunity, a service opportunity that I would like to share with you. Uh, let me get this on presentation mode here. So we have uh, this new service project called April Tools Day, and it is an opportunity for us to collect unwanted tools and then deliver them to another nonprofit who refurbishes the tools and provides them to people who need them. So we're kind of just um, hopefully, you know, helping along that process. Um, I do think that this um, fits the rotary mission quite well um, in helping people. Um, it also helps the environment for keeping these tools out of the landfills. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of information about um, this other um, nonprofit because I think you'll see that this is a very worthwhile project. So St. Joseph's Tool Chest is the nonprofit that will be refurbishing the tools. And they are located in Wisconsin. Um, there aren't a lot of places um, in the United States that do this. Um, but what they do is that they collect the tools, repair and refurbish them, and then donate them to other nonprofits. Uh, here are their standards. Um, those are the guys that are working on the tools. And you can see what they do is they actually have a sandblaster to take all you know rust off. They refinish them, repaint, and um, really make them to um, uh, be very serviceable. 
and um, not necessarily, you know, a charity uh, gift. Um, they provide them to nonprofits all over the world if they can, if they can um, kind of connect with another nonprofit who will deliver them. That's the problem, you know, is getting shipping containers, you know, over to, but they have shipped tools to India and um, Africa, uh, South America, and then also locally in the Midwest. Um, here are some of the um, past recipients, and you will see because of um, my connection with them, um, 125 Live received um, basically all the tools in their woodworking shop came from St. Joseph's Tool Chest, and Revolutionary Earth is right here in Rochester, and we provided them with um, refurbished gardening tools. So uh, we are going to be having an April Tools Day collection on April 17th. And it's going to be uh, staged at the 125 Live parking lot. So it's really great that a bunch of nonprofits are coming together for this good cause. And so maybe you're thinking, well, how can I help? Um, if you could publicize the event, that would be great. Um, we also have volunteer shifts. And you'll see that if you go to the Greater Rochester Rotary site, you can get a link to the volunteer, volunteer. Site to club runner. Um, if you have any tools to donate, wonderful please bring them on april 17th and then also i'm really reaching out to you as well connected members of the community if you know of any nonprofit looking for tools please let me know we're always looking for um, recipients for the tools and that's kind of how we had revolutionary earth speak at one of our meetings and i thought hey they could use tools and they were very very happy to receive these like new tools and you have seen this uh, flyer. Thank you so much, Lori, for putting this in the uh, your newsletter. We really, really appreciate that. But I think that you guys will enjoy having a um, you know service project. You know, during this time, it'll be outdoor with masks, so I think it'll work out very well. So if you have any questions, I'll put my email um, in the chat. But if you have any questions right now, I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh uh judy for uh, that and uh so you have <clears throat> you have uh, an interest in uh, signing up to be a volunteer i guess i'm assuming that you have that on your sign up sheet uh and uh that would either be on well will it be on our uh, moccasin flower in the uh in the uh, sign up uh, area or will it just be in the uh on the three club landing page which uh would also offer offer the opportunity for sign up so uh, in any case, uh, it sounds like a, a great a great program, and uh, again, one that uh, gives a, give would give us an opportunity to get out there and uh, help uh, help the community and in a healthy uh, way where we're outside, and not uh, not having to. Uh, uh, where I I assume you probably are still wearing masks, but uh, probably <clears throat> in a much more limited way. So, uh, thank you for that. Um, Jill uh, Cordes, are you on uh, on the uh, call here? I've only, like I said, I've only got one screen. I don't see Jill on it. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, we'll skip over that. But uh, I just wanted to put in a plug because it's uh, coming up fairly soon. Um, on uh, May first, uh, there is a three club effort uh, going on to uh, do tree planting. The, I think there, it's referred to as the 21 Tree Salute. That's the way they've named it. And uh, that event uh, uh, will require a sign up for volunteers to help plant trees uh, in, in coordination with the Rochester Public uh, 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 Park and Rec Department. And, uh, and so the effort is being made to purchase uh, uh, 2,2100 trees or 2,021 trees, I guess. And uh, we're looking for a purchase of uh, groups of 10 of those and uh, and so on. So uh, the information is in the uh, moccasin flower. And if, I'm assuming uh, if Lori gets it uh, on the uh, sign up, there'll be opportunity for sign up. So any uh, questions on that? Certainly, send me an email or uh, Jill Cordes is uh, kind of coordinating that for our club. Um, Tamson, uh, I had uh, suggested you might have something to say about Holiday Classic, but apparently you're not 
you're not ready to do that. Uh, did you get enough volunteers that you've got your dance card filled up? Uh, um, I, if we can always use more volunteers, right? right. Uh, so the holiday classic uh, committee meets monthly to plan the holiday classic that we do in December each year. We're moving forward and planning it for this year. So if you have any interest in joining the fun holiday classic committee, uh, let me know. I'll also put my email in the chat. Uh, we would love your help. Without Elizabeth on deck, uh, the committee is taking on a little bit more of the legwork and the behind the scenes duty. So anyone that's willing to pitch in would be uh, welcomed with open arms. All right. Thank you for uh, the update. And uh, so if there is an interest in uh, signing up uh, as, as a volunteer for, this is for the planning portion of this. It's not necessarily to sign up for doing work at the event yet. Uh, that's way that's a ways off, although it all comes together very fast. Um, I know that uh, based on what I saw, I seem to have gotten quite a few additional people that have volunteered. So that's that's a good uh, good thing. And we did pick up a couple of new members, um, which has been fantastic. But again, lots more work without Elizabeth. So anyone uh, who is willing, we would be happy to have you. Right. Some of the tasks include, the tasks include getting, getting hotel the rooms, room, figuring out if we're going to video stream, budgets. There's lots of wide variety of things. So you don't have to like basketball uh, to participate or help. Yeah. We don't want to talk about basketball at all. We're all talking March Madness. Submission that went on. Nobody else had the same problem, but all of my. Uh, all of my brackets fell apart after the first round, so I don't even want to look at them anymore. Ugh. But basketball is uh, is uh, coming in uh, in late uh, late December, so uh, give some thought to that. Um, is there anything else before we get into program that uh, anyone uh, would like to uh, bring up? I uh, I didn't see anything. Uh, Colin, you're not doing any additional Paul Harris uh, awards at this point. Um, not today. Not today. Right. Okay. Just well, a good. Uh, so I'm uh, just a comment, Chris. Yes. Uh, I got a phone call from uh, Ari Polis yes. answering one well, rotary question I had, and he says hello to everybody and to remind everybody it's Greek Independence Day. <laughs> okay. And I um, I haven't heard if they're going to do uh, Greek Fest this year, but uh, it, I think they canceled it last year. But we'll see. But thank you for the reminder. It was on last year. Oh, was it? Okay. Well, hopefully I'll get it again this year. Um, so I uh, am pleased to uh, introduce uh, Jamie Roth. I think it's pronounced Roth. Is that correct? From uh, the DMC. She's the uh, Destination Medical Center Director, Director of Community Engagement and Experience. Uh, Jamie has had uh, multiple roles in the DMC initiative since she had joined the team in 2013. So you've kind of been through the whole, uh, the whole uh, length of time on that, uh, uh, on that effort. Uh, and uh, she's responsible for development and implementation of the community engagement and experience strategy for DMC uh, and the DMC district, uh, focusing on building relationships through the community. So, uh, without any further introduction, uh, please welcome Jamie Rock uh, to uh, do a presentation here. And I assume, uh, Jamie, you've got uh, you've got a PowerPoint as well. Yes, I sure do. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Say, so would you remind me just a format? I think the email said. Well, I just want to make sure I leave enough time for question and answers at the end. Yeah. Well, uh, if you've got, uh, we're at about. 20 minutes. So we've got you've got 20, 25 minutes uh, or thereabouts, and we'd like to leave a little bit of question period at the time at the end. And uh, if people have questions, if they put them into the chat, then we can kind of sort through them uh, when uh, Jamie gets to the end of her uh, presentation. So, so there you go. Sounds great. Uh, Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to get my screen shared here and pull it up as a guide as we talk today. Uh, let's see, let's go this way. 
So good morning again, and thank you for having me. Um, first, before I kick off the presentation, I just want to say a heartfelt thank you for all that you do for our community. Really enjoy coming to these meetings and hearing about what your organizations do and the impact that you have, and it's, uh, it's just such an important piece to our community. Uh, so thank you for the time and effort that you put into that. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm Jamie Rothi. I've been with the DMC Initiative since it passed legislation in about 2013 and held a variety of roles. And um, today I'm here to share with you a little bit more about what DMC has been up to. I thought I'd start off with a little bit of DMC 101. Since it passed legislation um, over five years ago, um, I like to kind of get back to the basics just for a few minutes to kind of help level set like why is why do we have a DMC? What was it set up to do? And then that can launch us into, um, you know, are we doing what we want it to do? Um, so I thought I'd spend a little bit of time uh, giving some updates around the five-year update. Uh, we just completed a very extensive five-year update and then up, um, planning the next five years. And of course there's impact of COVID of that, which we'll talk about that. And then the last two items I wanted to bring up um, is more focused on how we're working differently. And I wanted to share um, some very project specific ways um, that we are intentionally working with the community differently. And I'm just challenging our community partners to be thinking about that too. And wanted to share some successes and challenges that we've had, um, but thought, um, you know, anytime that we have a chance to share that information, I think it's great because uh, we're all part of this community and are interacting with it as well. And um, I'm always would love um, your feedback and, um, and your uh, perspective on how things are going. So uh, we'll just get started. So again, we'll start off with just a little bit about DMC. Um, so back in 2009 and 10, you may recall, seems like forever ago now, that there was a fair amount of conversation at the national level about healthcare policy. And our leaders um, here in Minnesota and from Mayo Clinic spent a lot of time in Washington, DC, sharing about the Mayo model of care. Now at that same time, there was a lot of conversation back in Minnesota with Mayo Clinic leaders and Minnesota leaders about the future growth of Mayo Clinic. Um, and what did that look like? Um, and we had extensive workshops and gatherings with a variety of people. And what we discovered is that Mayo Clinic had seen a tremendous amount of growth in the past 20 years and was on the same track to see that growth in the next 20 years. But the challenge became that we understood that there was a gap um, in our tax base here in Rochester, which meant that we were on track to grow. Rochester was on track to grow at a phenomenal rate, uh, but we didn't have the tax base to support that growth. So our city didn't have the taxes um, to support the tax base to support the growth around um, infrastructure. So think about streets and roads and all the things below the ground that help our city to run. And so that spurred a conversation um, at the state level and with some other leaders across our state that said, we really want Mayo Clinic to continue to grow. We want Rochester to continue to grow. We want to attract businesses, um, more jobs. We want to diversify the state's economy. How do we do that together? And that's really where the DMC initiative came out of. It's at the basic level, it's a gap financing tool. Um, the state of Minnesota agreed uh, to um, and give a certain amount of funds to Rochester as long as we can show um, investment into the city. And so that's the basic of, of how it works. Now from that, there's all these different plans and all this different work, and we'll touch base a little bit about that today. Uh, but I wanted to share kind of how it came about um, and the reason why we have it. And the reason why it's great for the state of Minnesota um, and for our community. So within the DMC initiative, there's five goals. Our first goal is to create a comprehensive strategic plan. So we can't just take the money and run from the state. We gotta have a plan. Um, and we spent a number of years building that plan. And then just most recently, we did a major update with the five-year plan, which I'll talk about here shortly. We have to leverage the public investment. So that's the whole money and run thing. We can't take the $585 million of public money and just spend it how we want. We need to be very strategic about it. We need to use the comprehensive plan and we need to learn how how can we attract investment? And um, we'll talk a little bit about that. We have a goal around it um, of creating new jobs. Diversifying our economy um, is extremely important. And it's important before COVID, during, and after. Uh, and we'll share a little bit more about that and where we think, um, how we're doing and how we think we can grow. Uh, we need to continue to build the new net tax revenue. This is how we continue 
continue to build infrastructure in our community, public spaces, public transit, street, roads, sidewalks, parks, all incredibly important things for our community to have um, and amenities that we as community members use. And then achieving the highest quality patient, visitor, and community member experience. I moved to Rochester, gosh, in uh, 2007. And, um, you know, the city has changed even so much since then. Um, and it continues to grow and become um, even more vibrant. And well, one thing we know is that our city really grew up quickly around um, Mayo Clinic and Mayo Clinic's needs, um, both from an employee perspective and visitors and patients. And we know that people are really interested in coming to Rochester and using Rochester's downtown. Um, and how do we create a vibrant experience for our community members, not just patients and visitors? So this is a quick slide just to talk about the money. Um, as always, you know, I'm always happy to dive into details and um, chat offline about some of these things if there's some things that you're interested in, but I wanted to give you just a quick snippet of how the dollars work. So the way the legislation works is that um, the state of Minnesota agreed to contribute $585 million. That's the public dollars. Our goal is to attract $5.6 um, billion of investment into the downtown core, into the DMC district. Just about half of that is what Mayo Clinic um, has planned to contribute. And then the DMC along with other organizations role is to attract that additional investment. The way that the public dollars break down is the image on the right hand side. So it kind of it breaks down everybody's contribution to that. You can see the state aid is the majority of it, but the city of Rochester and also the county contribute to those dollars as well. So that's how it's all break down. It gets, I get confused by it sometimes. So, um, you know, when we're talking about DMC dollars and how it works, I thought this was a simplest slide to kind of start to show how you break it down and how we can use slides or how we can use um, the dollars as we go forward. So with that, um, let's dive into the five-year update. I'm hoping that um, that information was good foundational information and then we'll um, dive into this information. So every five years, the DMC um, is required to do a five-year update. So why do we do this? Um, the first is that we know that the market conditions change on a regular basis. And we don't just change um, or do this research every five years years, we're constantly looking at information, constantly trying to figure out, is the market responding? Has the market changed? What do we need to pay attention to? Um, but every five years, we really want to do a deep dive. Um, and we really want to um, do a deep analysis of what actually did happen in the last five years. We also want to account for how DMC catalyzed the growth. So DMC has um, a legal responsibility for how we spend these dollars and how we are attracting um, economic development. And so we need to look at all of that um, and gather all that information. And that tells us a lot about how we're doing and how we can move forward. Another piece that we wanna do um, is that we also wanna dive into community input. Uh, the community voice in the DMC plan um, is so important. And I think sometimes we don't share enough about this, uh, but it is extremely important to have uh, the community's input and community voice in every part of the plan. And so during this five-year update, it's another great time for us to gather that information. And then it's a requirement by state law. We have to update the plan every five years. So what's in the plan? Again, it's the results of um, the last five years, but then it helps us to figure out our priorities for the next five years. And then what's uh, really special, I guess, about this year's plan is that it includes COVID-19 impact analysis. And one of the things that we'll talk a little bit about as well is that, you know, every single city has been impacted by COVID-19, but not every other, every city is prepared for recovery. And we feel strongly that Rochester is positioned well for recovery for a number of reasons. And one of those is because the timing of this five-year update and the work that has been done in the community by all kinds of partners to help um, analyze that information, help set up our community um, for recovery, um, really creates a space for us to start from a position of strength. And we'll talk a little bit about that and I'll share some examples. So let's talk about some high level things that came out of the five-year plan. This five-year plan is also um, available on our website. Chris, I could um, include some links for you too for your website as well. Um, so people have easy access to it. So a couple of things I wanna highlight from this uh, screen is new jobs. 7,000 new jobs were created over the last five years and 80% of those uh, were more than Rochester's area of medium income. This is important for a couple of reasons. Oops, um, for a couple of reasons. 
Um, one, I want to clarify that DMC in no way, shape, or form claims that we created these jobs. That's not our responsibility. But what we want to do is attract investment that does create jobs. Um, the other thing that's important about these numbers is that we want to continue to attract jobs that have a higher area, um, higher income level uh, because it puts less stress on our whole system as a whole. Um, so as we continue to attract jobs, they're going to come in all shapes and fashion, um, but diversifying those jobs is incredibly important. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about um, is the plans and prototypes on this um, page. Sometimes in the beginning of the DMC initiative, I heard people say, well, where are the cranes? And it seems like it's moving so slow. And in the beginning, just like any business, there's a lot of planning that has to happen. And once DMC legislation was passed, there was a lot of work that had to go into some planning efforts. And one of those that we're just starting to see the benefits of is a rapid transit system. There was an immense amount of planning that went in to get us to this point where we could apply for federal funding. And that was work in the community and gathering information about how would our community use um, a mass transit system? What were the gaps today? Um, and what were the things in the future? I grew up in downtown Minneapolis, so right on the edge of Minneapolis. We didn't have a vehicle. Um, we used mass transit um, every single day to get where we needed to go, along with bikes and some other things to help get us to short trips. Um, and it's really amazing when you do some analysis of other cities like that that have these um, uh, very um, connected major mobility hubs and ways in which people move around the city and how it really starts to uh, level the playing field on how people get to work um, and their access um, to jobs, education. And so it's an incredibly important thing um, or piece of the plan that will have a big impact on our entire community. One of the other pieces I wanted to call out in the five-year plan is, well, how are we doing on investment overall? What does this look like? Is the plan working? You know, back when the, that legislation was passed, you know, there's a big question. You've got lots of really smart people in a room and they're trying to figure out, you know, how do we, how do, we do this? Um, and so this is how we're doing. So when we looked at the first phase, so the first five years, we showed that we used $98.4 million in public funding. So that's that out of that 585 million so far. So what have we done with that? And so the next uh, piece over shows the private investment that's been attracted, um, that's been invested in Rochester. We're at 963 million and where we targeted was 836 million. So we're just tracking just barely past that, which we feel is, um, is one good indicator of how um, the DMC initiative was set up. Um, and how it's working so far. The uh, image over just to the right is the way in which the dollars were used. I thought this was important. This is breaking down that 98 million. So how did the city, um, how did DMC work together um, to use these dollars? And you'll see the breakdown is some of it was to incentivize private development. Some of it was invested in the mobility planning, public realm, streets and sewers, and so forth. So it's a good breakdown of, um, of how we're currently using those dollars uh, to continue to attract new investment into Rochester. So now what do we need to do? Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, what did we learn and how do we move forward? You know, COVID-19 had incredible impact, like I mentioned on Rochester, but almost every city um, across America and every city across the globe. And it really had an unfair um, impact on our downtowns. We know that um, many of the businesses that are situated downtown that have business um, models that align with the downtown worker or um, tourism and travel um, have really been unfairly hit by this pandemic where normally if a if a tornado comes through or something, it's very localized and you're able to recover and move. And so now everybody's got to um, recover together. So um, a few things that we learned along the process, and we did some deep dive analysis with HRNA, uh, which is a firm that we worked with in the past. And on our website, there's big um, studies that were done um, and video of presentation. So if this is something that you want to learn more about, you can definitely dive into it. And I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, so we know that Rochester did see significant losses, just like many other cities. And we also learned that Rochester has fared far better than other cities during this pandemic. 
one of the things that I did during the pandemic is studied other cities to see where they were at and what was happening. And it doesn't, just because our numbers were better, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easier for us to recover. It just helps us understand where's our foundational level of how we're going to start to figure out recovery. What are our growth strategies? Um, how do we um, support businesses as we go forward? So a simple example of a way that we did that is we watched um, like the Minneapolis Downtown Council, for example, had um, their dashboard, which showed us what their numbers were. And a few months ago, um, their hotel rates, for example, occupancy rates are a number that we watch and their numbers were at 12 percent. Um, ours were still sitting at a 30 to 40 percent occupancy rate. Um, building occupancy rate for downtown Minneapolis at one point was at 7%. So think of all the buildings downtown Minneapolis, 7% occupied. Um, and ours, again, were 30% kind of hanging out um, and growing um, from there. Another piece that we watched, of course, were meals served in restaurants. This was incredibly hard um, on so many businesses. Um, and the number of uh, restaurants that have closed in downtown Minneapolis or other downtowns have been um, incredibly high. And for a long time, um, you know, seats, even when they had 50% capacity, were sitting at that 11, 12% uh, because of the people not coming downtown. Um, so those are things that we watched really closely, knowing that um, we wanted to understand where we were at from a Rochester perspective, and then how do we continue to grow? So what does this look like in action? So these are the things that we're gonna be focusing on um, and collaborating with other business um, organizations um, and partners. So one, uh, which is incredibly important, to supporting existing local businesses. This is something that's always been important to DMC. And I think sometimes um, I hear rumors or see rumors around that DMC doesn't like our local businesses, that we just want big box stores. And I can't tell you that is enough that that is um, completely opposite. The local businesses are extremely important. They help um, create the uniqueness and the vibrancy of our community. And we want to make sure that we're creating strategies to help to support them um, in their recovery um, and how they adjust to the new way of downtowns and how downtowns will work because they just uh, will not work the same moving forward in any downtown. And uh, we want to be helpful and mindful of that. We want to prioritize public infrastructure. Uh, this was something that's really important for cities to continue to invest in is that public infrastructure because that's what's going to attract um, other investors and developers and um, people to maintain their buildings and continue to grow and looking for places. Um, and public infrastructure is incredibly important. The city um, continued to do this over the pandemic. Um, DMC and the city both, uh, there's some hands raised and um, questions asked of that. And everything that we're seeing now um, on the research says that that was the right choice to do is to continue to invest in public infrastructure during that pandemic. Um, and we've seen that in other countries and cities as well. We have a, a big task ahead of us to reuse the excess real estate capacity, um, and but we need to do it creatively. Uh, there'll be businesses that won't return. There'll be people that'll be moving to hybrid in our downtowns. So what do we do with the space? And we've been uh, learning from other cities who are already starting to do some of this work. And I'm focusing on, um, for example, women and minority owned businesses that typically have not had a fair chance um, to enter into the market. And so how are we partnering with organizations that might already be using on working with these organizations um, to create uh, great spaces for them to be a part of the downtown working environment? Diversifying the economy is gonna to continue to be of importance as well as we look at attracting companies um, and creating new jobs. We have to support development proactively as well. So what does that mean? Um, in the past five years, it was a little bit reactionary to the market. You had people come in and there was a lot of conversation about, gosh, are we building too many hotels? Are there things that are happening? But that was a lot of reacted to the market gaps um, in the data that people quickly grabbed onto and started building. Now this next work is gonna be even more strategic and more important uh, because it needs to fit together as the whole puzzle and as the system. So as we even think about Discovery Walk, it can't just be a linear park on a street with some trees and benches. It needs to work with the space around it. It needs to work with the businesses and potential um, uses of it. Um, there, it's all kind of a system together. And so as we think about the riverfront, as we think about just recently, you may have saw um, a presentation about um, some other spaces. Uh, there's a, a lot of um, work to be done to say, how do these all connect? 
And then the last one is to work from anywhere. Um, if you can work from anywhere, work from Rochester. So if people are now able to work from anywhere um, and remote work, how do we attract uh, workforce um, to work from Rochester? And how do we keep people that can work anywhere to work from Rochester? We really wanna leverage our great walking community, the size and the safety, um, the great schools. We also wanna make sure that we're um, attracting them uh, to work right next to Mayo Clinic as well. All right. So with that, I wanted to highlight two things. Um, let's see, I wanted to highlight two things quickly and then we'll get to questions. Let me check my time quick. All right, I'm gonna go through these two things really quickly, but I wanted to share um, two examples of how we're working differently in the community. And um, I'm doing some presentations on these in other places in the community, so they're much more deeper dive, uh, but quickly wanted to give some examples. Um, so I need to back. So the first one is the Heart of the City project. I think everyone's aware of this. It's a very extensive construction project that's happening um, along First and Peace Plaza. And what's happening here um, is below ground infrastructure changes, which is in really incredibly important. And then some beautification and some center of gravity type design that creates a space where if you have family to come into town, you're going to want to start at the plaza or you might end at the plaza. There's interactive art, there's water features, the beautiful Peace Fountain has been um, really even more memorialized. It's gorgeous. Um, over 100 trees. Um, there's a variety of things that are added into this area. We knew that this construction was going to be uh, very disruptive. Um, and so months prior, probably about seven to eight months prior to this construction project happening, we started meeting with all the businesses and we interviewed all of the stakeholders and businesses in this area, the landowners, users, and we brought our whole team with us. So we brought our construction partners, we brought uh, our designers, we brought the city and DMC, and we gathered all this information together. And then we started to synthesize it. We wanted to learn from it and say, okay, what, what information can we take from this and how can it inform um, our strategies moving forward? And from that grew something that we call a business forward strategy. And you may have heard, um, if you listen to council meetings or in the news, this is something that we've been talking about a lot and something that's now being used in other projects across the city. This is taking information from the people that are impacted by the construction and building a construction plan around them. So it's not actually the construction happening to them, but we're kind of doing it together. So it's three buckets, microphasing, which is breaking down the construction by priorities for the businesses, commitment to communication, making sure that we're almost over communicating, and then programming and activation. What does the space need um, during construction and how do we activate it? I'm gonna give you a couple quick examples of what that is. Um, these are just quick snippets of um, the construction site downtown and some different things that we did. Um, one of our commitments um, we heard again from the businesses is that they wanted clear communication in a um, concise way. We held weekly meetings um, through COVID, through Zoom and a weekly newsletter that went out to all the businesses and anybody impacted and all of our community partners around the construction site. We had a call every week about what was happening, and then we actively listened to hear what could be improved upon and how do we move forward. Um, so on the left side, you see uh, this kind of uh, pedestrian walkway plan that was updated every week. Everybody had access to their front doors at all times. Uh, we made uh, sure that that was something that was incredibly important to the businesses and in that area. The middle picture, this bright colorful picture is lighting up the construction site in a beautiful way to help create a safe space for people to walk through at night. We collaborated with the RDA on a curbside pickup zone. This was something that we had to shift due to COVID that everybody's curb, our doors were closed. So how can we take our curbside strategy and help the entire city? Um, and we had jumped to number five. This was a great um, partnership with KA and the businesses on the street. Um, uh, the construction superintendent, Troy Dale, did a tremendous job at building relationships with one. And this picture is actually with the owners of uh, Natalie uh, Victoria from Victoria's. Um, and they collaborated many, many times to make sure that her patio was open when they needed patio seating. They removed a sidewalk and replaced it in front of that whole block in a week um, to make sure there was limited disruption. Um, and it was done in time uh, for winter, so there'll be minimal disruption during spring. 
These are all examples of things that have come out of the business forward strategy. Again, just by spending time early on listening to the businesses and understanding what their concerns are and then building that into the strategies. And we're using this now, for example, in the Broadway project and other um, construction projects that have the impact um, potential to have a major impact. And this is just a quick rendering of what the plaza would look like. Imagine yourself sitting on the Galleria um, front stair, or front door, looking west across to the Gonda building. One other way that we're working differently um, that I wanted to mention is the Discovery Walk and Discovery Square process. So Discovery Square um, is a 16 block subdistrict that's focused on diversifying the economy. We want to recruit new companies to come to Rochester and you may have seen that the One Discovery Square building is now 97% leased with new businesses in that space. Discovery Square 2 is under construction um, with the goal of opening um, late, or I'm sorry, first quarter of 2022. Alongside of that, along second is where we see this um, uh, new parkway being built. And the goal of this is like um, really a linear park that connects Annenberg Plaza down to Soldiers Field. And we want to design a, a park that meets the needs of our community and our users of our downtown. And a lot of times in the past, what will happen is a big design firm comes in, kind of tells you, does a little bit of research and tells you what to do. And we didn't want to do it that way. Um, it was incredibly important for us to have more of our community voices participating in this process. We did two things differently with this project that are now being implemented with other projects as well. The first was that we used community artists along with our designers to help design spaces and contribute art to the process. And they're also brought in from the very beginning of the project. Many times artists are brought in at the end and saying, here's your spot to put art. And this time these three artists uh, were brought in from the beginning so they could see and be a part of the design process and then figure out how their art and design comes together. Um, and the art will be have so much more of an incredible um, impact uh, in that space. The other piece that we work differently is something called a community co-design process. This was a really exciting um, first project that we did in a kind of prototype fashion to say, how do we actually hire community members to be part of the design team? People that have walked different walks and lived different lives from an age perspective, um, from a socioeconomic perspective, different ethnic backgrounds, and how do we bring that into a space so that helps to inform the design process. And it was really um, a valuable process for us to learn about, something that many other cities do not do. Um, and now we're actually using this process um, in our rapid transit system um, process. And then we're also um, using it or planning to use it in some upcoming projects as well. Um, these community co-designers are, uh, are paid positions on our project team. Um, and it's really been um, very, very valuable in the process. So I just wanted to share that with you as well, just some little ways that we're uh, working differently and, and challenging um, our partners and colleagues across the city and other organizations to look at things differently as well. So with there, I know I rattled really quick, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and maybe we'll open it up for questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, the, uh, I only see one, uh, one question so far in here about uh, uh, the uh, question that Ashok has uh, posed is, uh, what are the functional categories that are pri prioritized in terms of jobs <clears throat> for the upcoming uh, five years? Uh, it has implications for public partner, public private partnerships and so on. And uh, how do we diversify our executive leaders with equity and inclusion more than name and face only? Uh, the whole the whole issue about diversity and 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 uh, education about diversity it looks like you you check a lot of those boxes in terms of your approach uh, for gaining input. But how do we actually make that implemented in the in the community? That's a great question. Thank you for it. So there's a variety of things uh, that we're doing um, and I'm happy to dive deeper into uh, it maybe. Um, and I'm wondering, so a couple of things I would mention is that uh, one of the things that we've done, you know, we really advocated for the new position at the city 
the new city uh, director of diversity and inclusion. We also just uh, received another um, significant grant to hire um, another full-time staff member that'll focus on diversity and inclusion. It's a shared position with um, city and DMC as well. That'll be through the McKnight Foundation. So it's great that some of these positions are being um, funded so that we're able to do more work. Um, also, we're looking at trying to find out how we can partner with organizations that are doing some of this work already. So you may have heard uh, like the Collider Foundation that received a significant grant that's focused on um, women, and minor women and minority owned businesses and entrepreneurs. And how are we um, supporting those that work um, and making sure that um, that information um, is at the like front most part of our conversations, especially when we're thinking about future um, partnerships um, and future development. I'm not as close to some of this work, but I'd be happy to um, make some introductions to um, Chow, the new director of diversity inclusion, or Kevin Bright on our team, um, who works really closely in some of these areas as well. I had a, a couple of questions. As you know, I'm a uh, retired architect, so I've been watching this uh, stuff for a long time. And uh, a couple of a uh, couple of things uh, you mentioned the uh, micro phasing that you're doing in the downtown, and you know the practicality of how you make development uh, and and repairs and uh, and construction happen in such a way that uh, keeps the businesses open, and even with uh, what's going on with uh, COVID and and uh, and the lack of people downtown, uh, it's uh, it's really obvious that uh, the time frame on completion of that construction is is dragging out at least in my opinion um, has has was the micro phasing a part of the reason that that project is dragged on so long so are you are you talking about the heart of the city project specifically yeah specifically that one so actually that project is accelerated so it was it's planned to not be complete until the end of august and um, we're currently, we've done a couple of things. So I'll back up. The original planning was for the end of August. Um, we built that plan uh, based upon um, trying to make sure that businesses had access to front doors and back doors for loading and unloading um, and some limited times of construction. You could imagine that it was, um, you know, the hotels are down there, there's some housing down there. And so you want to be careful about what time you're using those big machines to drill everything, you know, 30 feet into the ground. Um, and so you're exactly right. When the construction, um, uh, when the construction or when COVID happened, we had to, um, we actually regrouped together as a team with all of our partners and said, you know, how do we help support the businesses and how do we move through this faster? And so we've constantly been looking at how can we rephrase um, the project so that we make sure that we're having the least amount of impact on the businesses. So right now, um, the goal is to have uh, first open by the first week in July. So it'll be open two months early. Um, which is great. And then we have some finishing that we need to do on the plaza and that'll be done. We're looking at the beginning of August. So um, we're really excited that it's been going um, so quickly. That project also was very extensive. So you might recall there was, like I mentioned, some very significant infrastructure that was done below grade. And that was what happened all last year. You might recall some of the images of the huge machinery that was brought in. It was quite invasive and quite loud, but um, because of COVID, they were able to use that equipment more efficiently and effectively and quickly to get in and out um, of those projects. So it's moving forward. Um, it still does, um, you know, have an impact, but we're really feeling um, good about the direction that we're going and the timing that's happening with that project. Okay. Um, another, uh, another question that, uh, that I have, at least, is uh, with all the development uh, that's happening with uh, housing and commercial development, uh, around the downtown and even in the periphery, uh, it seems like there is a lot of development that is uh, is now coming online that may not be responding real well to the to the market. Uh, and of course, with COVID and and the downturn in the economy, it's all impacted by that. But uh, what what's your uh, sense of how the projects are being absorbed, and both on the housing side as well as the the ground floor? you know, the ground floor commercial space, which seems to be uh, becoming hard to fill. 
So a couple, a couple uh, answers. The first one is that, you know, the work that we did with the five-year update and HRNA and the impact of COVID still shows that there's going to be an incredibly strong demand for housing in our downtown. So while there are times that it looks like it may have um, slowed down a bit with people moving um, into these spaces, we are anticipating that the demand is still going to be high. And we're seeing that still with developers and investors coming um, and looking and, um, and reviewing that information. So we feel really confident. That also helps to inform our rapid transit systems and others, you know, that has that downward impact. We also know that downtown, um, you know, all cities are going to see a little bit of a pendulum swing right now. So we have everybody kind of right working from home. You're going to have some people come back to hybrid and people are going to hang out in hybrid and working from home. And then we're going to normalize again at some point. Uh, what we find though for Rochester is that um, that's going to be similar um, as well. But because we still have a strong um, draw for downtown housing, um, what we're going to see with our retail, um, and that was kind of the focus of the first goal in that strategy is that Many of our downtown businesses met the needs of downtown employees and visitors and patients, um, tourists, tourists, and not so much uh, our community members. So how are we taking this new data and this new analysis and helping it to be translated into business strategies that businesses can then apply and say, okay, how do I shift? If I know that there's going to be this many more people living downtown, what do I need to do? So. Um, um, so if there's a, if I'm an entrepreneur and I'm looking for a space downtown, um, I can start to align. Um, also wondering about, um, like, for example, um, there's many businesses downtown that we work closely with that, you know, haven't updated their business strategies in quite some time. So we're looking at, you know, how can we bring resources together with those businesses that have been in place and had the same strategy for 20, 30 years and help them to shift so they don't have to close their doors, but they have the resources to shift strategies or add new strategies in. And that'll help um, to grow um, and fill some of those spaces um, as we go forward. And then as Mayo Clinic continues to bring more people in, you know, we'll continue to see that change. Mayo Clinic's patterns have changed just a little bit. Um, you know, patients are coming in for appointments here and there, like coming in for an appointment leaving where before they were coming in Sunday through Thursday. And we're just going to see that shift back again. Um, they're also being allowed to bring other um, people with them now to appointments where that couldn't happen. So their um, patterns are changing um, back to the previous patterns. We're watching that really closely as well. Yeah. That's a big issue for sure. The, uh, the uh, pattern for bringing locals into the downtown area, obviously the Thursdays on first was probably the single most uh, a most uh, dramatic change that drew, drew people in. Uh, obviously, a lot of a lot of visitors and uh, and those uh, people from outside the community came uh, were a part of that too. But um, that uh, that will hopefully get geared back up and become a significant uh, again a significant part of our community experience. Um, Somebody asked a question. I guess Mark Drips asked the question: With all the all the trees going in downtown, how are you going to control the crows? That's a great question. <laughs> over the city, or what? Uh, what what's the plan? <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, I love crow questions. So crows. There's a few things that are happening. Um, you know, and with the new trees that are coming into uh, the downtown core. So let's talk about heart of the city. Uh, there was an extensive amount of studying that happened about crow behavior and where they like um, to roost and why. Um, and we could study our own crows really because they spend so much time in our downtown in the winter. Uh, but one of the things that we do know about crows is that they tend to roost in large branching out trees. And so all the trees that were chosen for the downtown Heart of the City project are all called columnar trees or columnar trees. They're all trees that grow up. And then they're positioned in a way that they're um, closer together. So you feel like there's a little bit more density. So a crow is not going to roost like this, you know, and want to sit on that tree. What will come in those trees is hopefully some, um, some songbirds um, and some smaller birds, uh, but the crows should stay away. Um, and so then our friends with the city and the Rochester Downtown Alliance will continue to mitigate uh, those challenges with 
all the things that they're trying to figure out how, but that's one of the things that we're working really closely is to really make sure uh, picking specific tree species to go into these areas. What comes along with all this, all this technical planning is certainly practical things like that. So it's uh, kind of, kind of interesting to watch uh, it all happen. So um, let's see here. Let me, let me see if I can hit any other uh, questions here. Um, I don't see anything else that, uh, I guess one, one question uh, that uh, you didn't talk about is ed the education component in our downtown area, the university uh, uh, situation and, and uh, how, is, how has that been impacted or will continue to impact the, the downtown uh, development? At University of Minnesota Rochester and our other partners, you know, across the educational system are incredibly important. You know, I think, um, there's a few things we've built such a great relationship uh, with the University of Minnesota Rochester, especially as they're thinking about their growth strategies. You know, they've shifted a few times. You might recall that, you know, for a while there was kind of this master plan idea growing that they were going to grow their campus down by Soldier's Field. Um, then some things changed in their strategies, so they decided to kind of wait. Uh, they looked at some potential partnerships, but then um, COVID hit. So the timing for that just wasn't right. And these types of things, like this example, is really normal. Um, it's just hard because everything is like in front of us all the time. So, you know, it's easy for us to pick it apart. But if you look at other cities, there's ideas where things will come up and they'll kind of go away. And there'll be ideas and they don't quite work together. But this is how we get to the best ideas. And so right now, one of the things the University of Minnesota Rochester has done, for example, is they have space in one Discovery Square. And if you talk to Chancel Carroll, she'll share with you that I mean, having students right next um, to the entrepreneurs could have been, you know, the best decision that they made in the position that they are. Um, you know, they're getting a chance to bump into and be around amazing people, and that's inspiring them and creating opportunities for collaboration. So there's going to be more and more of those opportunities as they continue to grow. Um, and then, of course, we're always looking at, um, you know, Winona State University has continued to um, extra their campus downtown. Um, you know, Janine and her team there have just done a tremendous job at trying to understand the unique needs of our downtown and how do they align their programs. Um, just so many have done a great job at trying to help us um, think about the importance of that part of our um, community and how that fits in. Obviously, uh, Janine and uh, Lori Carroll are both uh, part of our Rotary Club, so I'm glad that you mentioned uh, their their uh, uh, their uh, area of concern. Uh, um, one uh, one other quick one uh, that I I would uh, you touched on briefly, and and uh, it's a component that I think is really critical, and that's the the transportation uh, aspect, the the rapid transit or the rollout of of that. Um, you mentioned uh, that it. It uh, is in the development stage, and I, I understand that it's still uh, at least several years out before we really start to see any activity that is beyond just reconstruction of, of the existing right of way, for example, on 2nd Street and so on. Can you touch on that a little bit in terms of what the timeline might be? Sure, absolutely. So one of the reasons why it, these have such long lead times is because the partially partial part of the funding comes federally. So we have to um, gather information and produce documents um, and to show the work that we're doing. And then that's years out. Um, so that's part of this lead time, the work that we have to do. And it's quite extensive when you think about creating a mass transit system for a city that not only works for today, but works for the future. And I think that's an important piece to remember too, is that um, this transportation system is <coughs> last for many, many, many years, um, not just. <coughs> so um, we know that there's changes in the short term due to COVID of our downtown, but for the long term, we're still projecting um, a high need for mass transit, not only for potential employees that are working downtown, but also for the residents of downtown and the community members that will want to be um, using the downtown amenities. So everything continues to move forward. Uh, we're continuing to watch closely um, and pay attention to the trends and what's happening um, and continue to do some extra work in that area. I don't have the exact date, Chris, but I want to say it's um, it was five years. So it's like 2025, I think, is when they imagined it to be complete. Um, and that's the first, that portion of it is from, um, it's kind of known right now as the Mayo West lot. It's 
out by the, um, I guess, Cascade Lake and would come across second. Um, and then there'd be a turnaround kind of area over by the Civic Center and back. There's a south leg or jet leg that goes down um, to uh, the fairgrounds and that's continuing to be analyzed um, and more information will be brought back to that. That's an incredibly important piece um, from a, I would say from a, um, an equity standpoint, there's so many neighborhoods that are on that arm of the leg that would really benefit from having a mass transit system that could quickly get them in and out of the downtown, where right now it's incredibly difficult to catch the bus that's only built around kind of um, traditional downtown um, hours, but we've got tons of people in hospitality and other areas that really need um, access to transportation, a reliable access to transportation. So we're advocating for that um, to continue to move forward and there'll be more information to come on that. Yeah, that's a huge area because it uh, really has, not everybody can live downtown, especially with the rates that these uh, new apartments are uh, causing. So people are gonna want to have access without necessarily getting in cars and then having to store cars and so on. So it's a real big issue, so. Well, we're, uh, we're well over our time frame. It's 108, and uh, I appreciate uh, everybody uh, chiming in with questions. And uh, Jamie, uh, you, uh, you are available via email and at the DMC website. So uh, if you have further questions for Jamie, I'm sure that she'd be glad to, to follow up and answer them. But uh, in the interim, I certainly want to thank you for uh, your presentation. I think it was really informative and uh, very helpful for us to understand kind of where you are with the, with the current uh, situation with DMC. And we're looking forward to uh, opening up our economy and, uh, and our world. And uh, this will be an exciting period of time for uh, all of us in Rochester uh, as we move forward. So, so thanks again for, uh, for doing that. Uh, we are uh, kind of reaching the end of timeline here. So um, I want to uh, close today by giving thanks to Colin, who had to bail out on us a little bit early, uh, for hosting the Zoom meeting today, John Woodruff uh, for the four-way test, and Audrey Betcher for the words of inspiration. So, and uh, certainly to Jamie uh, uh, Roth for joining us today and giving us a very in interesting and informative and timely program. So as we adjourn, uh, go and serve remembering that Rochester and Rotary opens opportunities. So thank you all and uh, we are adjourned. Thank you everybody. Take care.